wander the streets of Western Creek today and the summer of 2003 almost feels like a bad dream. I have plenty of height, probably over 100 feet. This is a rare situation. We need some funders here urgently. Numerous houses are alive here. Get me some more help, please. It's almost unthinkable now. Streets in the national capital ablaze. Day turned to night. The panic of a last minute evacuation. And the terror for those who stayed to fight the flames. When we were driving out, it was like Armageddon. You know, there was, there was police cars and ambulances sort of turned over in the street. There was fire everywhere. Um, it was just totally crazy. The fire was like a fluid. It was almost like a wave of water. It wasn't like what you think fire being like. It was unlike anything you've seen, at least in my life, before or since. I just looked around and I wasn't even stressed. I just looked around and I thought, oh, this is the day that you die. It's 20 years this week since Canberra's worst natural disaster. The fires that roared into the suburbs, taking lives and hundreds of homes. For those who lived here, it's a bit like a shared nightmare. The houses may have been rebuilt and some of the forests have regrown, but Canberra's darkest day left a deep emotional scar. Winds tending moderate to fresh west to northwesterly tomorrow. Temperatures from 17 tonight to 38 tomorrow. In January 2003, the ACT was in the grip of one of its worst recorded droughts. The undergrowth crackled like cornflakes underfoot. And when dry lightning storms struck the Brindabella Ranges, a slow motion disaster began. For 10 days, four fires snaked their way through inaccessible valleys and slopes of Namadji National Park. But then, on the 18th of January 2003, catastrophic fire conditions pushed the blaze into a single, unstoppable force of nature. The rural firefighters, parks rangers and aerial water bombers that had been battling the fires for days had no choice but to pull back to safety and wait for the fire to reach the city itself. Craig, this is the corner of Yukonbeen and Warragamba Avenue Duffy, which is where the 2003 bushfire initially made contact and impacted on the southern suburbs of Canberra. Sean McIntyre was a city firefighter called in to provide last line defence to the suburbs. What his crew found that afternoon was overwhelming. What happened here 20 years ago was incomprehensible. Good luck boys. Uh, it's impossible for people to imagine what it was like, the heat, the noise, um, the lack of oxygen in the air, the darkness, um, and the panic, all of those things on a, on a serene day like today don't seem real, they seem like stuff of a movie. It was the sort of blaze that claimed fire trucks and forced firefighters to improvise a desperate defence of homes. The smoke hadn't even cleared when Sean gave the ABC the fire brigade's first interview about the ferocity of that firestorm and how lucky he was to survive. Survival was, uh, was our instinct and we had to retreat uh, to safer point uh, a couple of streets back. It was the helplessness of having to let houses burn while moving on to those that could be saved. Two decades on, there's acceptance of sorts of an impossible job well done. At the end of the day, trying to feel that gratitude and appreciation for, for coming out the other side of it and um, and what we did achieve, not what we lost. More than 500 homes were destroyed that afternoon, mostly in the southwestern suburbs of Duffy, Holder, Chapman and Rivette. Four residents died, overcome by smoke and flames. There were hundreds of serious injuries too, burns, broken bones, heart attacks and hospitals overwhelmed with patients struggling to breathe. It was a lot cooler when it had a telescope in it, I'm telling you. But it wasn't just an urban disaster. 
The world-famous Mount Stromlo Observatory, surrounded by pine forests, was a sitting target. The part of this building I really miss is the library because that, you know, it was a library that went back over 120 years and it was just had everything in it and it's all gone and irreplaceable. Heritage telescopes were reduced to molten glass by the unimaginable heat. What was the, the feeling there? Was it a, a feeling of loss? Yes. Yeah. I haven't obviously thought about it that much for a long time. Um, yeah, this is a place of history. And the impact on the bush capital's backyard was at first, incomprehensible. The leafy cotter reserve scene of family picnics for generations, now blackened, ugly. Tidbinbilla Nature Reserve all but destroyed, leaving a sole koala, singed, but somehow still alive. It was a paradise lost. For four or five years there, it was, it was idyllic. You know, you'd, you'd wake up in the morning and kangaroos in the backyard, and winter, the snow and the Timberbilla range. It, it was absolutely idyllic, it really was. Park ranger Brett McNamara lived in the heart of the Tidmanbilla wilderness. But even this seasoned firefighter was unable to save his family home. You look at this stuff, you sort of think, well, this is all we've got left. There's nothing else that we've got left. And when you've lost everything, even the smallest memento, becomes a family treasure. I, I made that sign. I, um... This sign here, this sign here. I'm surprised uh, Dad's kept it for so long. This was me trying to be like, all right, well, let's try and raise a little bit of money, you know, for the families that had it worse than, you know, we had at the time. Um, so, yeah, collected some rocks, um, put them up for sale. I think we made about 20 bucks from it. Um, and I remember donating that money down to the, uh, the Bushfire Recovery Centre at right. Lions. Mm. It was about the giving afterwards. You know, the, the, the event itself, the day itself was horrific, but the way the Canberra community opened up their hearts afterwards was, was, was truly extraordinary, it really was. And to my mind, that says a lot about Canberra. It really does. The fires probably, uh, other than the Canberra Raiders winning their first premiership, was the first sign that Canberra really had a bit of a heart and a soul and we could bleed and we could burn just like any other place. How about for now, we just do tops? It was an international outpouring of help. Armies of volunteers mobilised to feed and clothe those who'd lost everything to the flames. But it wasn't long before the public mood shifted and residents began demanding answers of their leaders. What I'm saying is, don't cheer me. If you want to blame somebody, blame me. Cheer those people in this community who put their lives on the line. In hindsight, why didn't you actually attack the fire harder and sooner than you did? Well, they didn't because they didn't, uh, because uh, the fire was beyond their expectation. They handled it as professionals in the way that they would normally have handled a fire. Former Chief Minister John Stanhope was at first reluctant to speak to the ABC about those difficult days back in 2003, when community frustration boiled over into anger, aimed squarely at the senior firefighters who failed to sound the alarm. In your defence of those public servants, you famously said, if you want to blame someone, blame me. Do you regret making that statement? No, not for a minute. <laughs> so, um, I, but I when people did it. try to blame I, you, you didn't want to accept that? Well, no, I had no reason to accept any blame for anything as far as I'm concerned. I maintain that, no. I was basically saying, I guess it was a, I don't know, I, I, I dwelt on it, why I said it. I said it because I was angry. Uh, I said it because people that I respected uh, and that worked for me uh, were being attacked. And uh, as, the, as the leader, as the person in charge, I thought, well, look, if you want to blame somebody for this disaster, I'm the Chief Minister, blame me. Uh, so it, I was defending um, my officers, which I think leaders should do, uh, and which most don't. What followed was a damning internal review that found the fires might have been stopped if they'd been attacked more aggressively in the critical first hours. All stand, please. And then a coronial inquest, which recommended better bushland burn-offs to reduce the fuel load and the risk of fire. But at their heart, both inquiries were scathing of the lack of official warnings about the real threat to the suburbs. 
and that's what still stings today. In retrospect, you can say, well, you failed, your best wasn't good enough. Uh, and, uh, but in hindsight, of course, we can say that about so many aspects of our lives. Um, and I can understand those that lost loved ones, those that lost their home, think, well, your best wasn't good enough. But it's all we had to give, and we gave it. If you live in Western Creek, Woden, Belconnen or Tuggeranong, you should be on high alert. And this situation is not confined now just to the Namaji National Park. It is well and truly in our neighbourhoods. It was absolutely pitch black by 4.30 in the afternoon. And then I went on air at 5 o'clock and I stayed on air for 12 hours, bringing updates on the hour and the half hour um, in a very you know, rapidly evolving situation. The smoke around here is, is, is really, really thick. Uh, I can only see one house at this stage. There's definitely a burnt out car. Nobody expected what happened. It, that, that was quite confronting for a lot of people, that just the, the suddenness of it all, you know, the way that it came into town. In a time before smartphones and live streaming, media outlets struggled to pass the warnings on as quickly as they were needed. Amongst the chaos, the advice from authorities was often out of date, sometimes contradictory. You stay with the house unless they really have somewhere they know that they can positively go. And the worst place under these conditions is actually on the road. The house is the safest place to be. Leaving residents torn about how to respond. The only we can do is just... No, I think you should come out, mate. If you was going to get in, we'll you should come out if you want. Brett, see? Say, say, say we should go. You've been in the industry a long time. Have you ever seen a news day like that? Never, ever. And I think it's the day that Canberra lost its innocence. But it was just the scale of the tragedy. We've never had anything like that in Canberra. From a Canberra story point of view, we've never had anything like that up until that day. And thankfully, we've never had anything like that since. Show me where it is. Hi. Dark. Sun's up. We t always took the view that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, uh, whereas other people were totally broken by it. Um, the fires broke relationships. Uh, some people couldn't face going back and had to flee Canberra entirely. We should never forget the day. We should never forget the suffering and the pain and the compassion and the generosity, but we should never forget the lessons learnt and the fact that we, uh, we can't let our community be let down like we were that day again. Residents in several suburbs are battling to protect their houses tonight as bushfires swirl through the national capital and surrounding parts of New South Wales. For many of us, the 18th of January 2003 feels like a lifetime ago. But at the same time, we can still remember every detail of how that day unfolded. Some of the raw emotional edges have been smoothed off over the years, but it did fundamentally change us. And for those who stared down the flames, there will always be unanswerable questions. But perhaps also a challenge to rise from the ashes stronger than before. Life is too short to stuff around, you know. If do the stuff. If you want to get out of the job that you don't like, don't stay there. Like it's it's you can make change and don't wait till you're standing in a burning house to go, oh my God, I've only got one life and I can't mess this up. The experts agree the bush capital remains vulnerable to major fires and it's likely to get much worse. Another Canberra fire season and a new generation of parks rangers is learning the tools of the trade. Increasingly, their job means learning how to control fires, when to light them and when to fight them. Because managing fuel loads in the remote reaches of Namadji National Park can help keep the national capital safe. It was a lesson learnt the hard way in January 2003, when lightning storms ignited fires that roared into the Canberra suburbs. It was the ACT's darkest day and one that shattered faith in our ability to protect ourselves. It was pretty horrific. We lost lives, we lost homes and in a sense we probably lost a little bit of confidence in ourselves as an organisation to be able to deliver what our community most needed. We'll just lift on either side from the booms like that. 
But future fires won't be fought the same way. That's the direction it's going to fly in. This high-tech drone could mean the difference between a small, controllable blaze and an unstoppable megafire. You really need to be able to get a good thermal camera to have a look at the lightning locations as soon as possible after the lightning strikes so you really know whether there has been an ignition that is an issue. The idea is to fly the drone behind lightning storms using artificial intelligence to detect strikes and send real-time data back to ground controllers. It's a job traditionally left to trained spotters in light aircraft. But under dangerous conditions, drones could do it much better. We would be able to send in a, a drone with a, a good thermal camera in conditions that you wouldn't be prepared to send a, a crewed vehicle. Like flying at night, uh, flying in uh, less good weather, flying in smoke. There have been situations in the past where crewed helicopters were unable to fly because the, the smoke was too thick. It's part of a multi-million dollar project that's seen the Australian National University partner with commercial interests to bring firefighting into the 21st century. And another key part of the puzzle is way up here. Traditionally, the early detection of fire has relied on towers like this one at Cohen Forest. There are four of them dotted around the ACT. But they're only useful if there's a spotter on duty ready to call in the coordinates of any smoke they see. On days of elevated fire, so where there's a heightened risk to the ACT community and surrounding areas, we have people that come up here and um, crew the tower. Uh, they are up here from typically from around that 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, all the way through to, in the worst case scenario, on a total fire band day, to last light. It does get hot and it's quite mentally draining, uh, having that constant scanning of the, the environment, um, looking for those signs of smoke. So, to help the humans out, the towers have high-resolution cameras. Here's that fire we saw earlier, the hazard burn conducted by ACT Parks, picked up on camera from Cohen Forest Tower and beamed back to ESA headquarters. By using the cameras, um, it means that we can have a better visual over the ACT on a 24-7 uh, basis, where at the moment we only put people up in the towers during those elevated fire danger days. Dr Marta Yebra studied the dangers of wildfires in her homeland of Spain before recognising the enormous academic potential here in Australia. I realised that uh, I think Australia needed my uh, capabilities as well and there was a lot to research here in terms of bushfires. Now, as director of the ANU's Bushfire Research Centre of Excellence, she's helping develop new, smarter ways of detecting and fighting fire, using a network of cameras, ground sensors, satellites to monitor fuel loads, those early detection drones and computer modelling to not only show exactly where a fire is but what type of vegetation it's burning. We believe that there is no single technology that can get uh, firefighters early to the fire so it's a combination of many that will give that early detection capability. And with a changing climate the stakes have never been higher. The interval between major fires is shrinking and fires are burning hotter and more unpredictably than firefighters have seen before. You've been in the job for a fair while now. Do you feel like the rules are changing? Um, I know that the word unprecedented is, is thrown around, um, but the 2019-2020 the uh, so season um, threw out a lot of the rule books. Um, the fire behaviour we're getting at 2, 3 in the morning was usually what we'd get at 2, 3 in the afternoon in the, in the peak of the day. So a lot of our opportunities to do that strategic backburning uh, were lost um, and the fire behaviour was just incredible and, and dangerous to put crews into. So Tony, tell us a little bit about this forest type. This is red stringy bark forest, quite rare in the ACT, high ecological values. Tony Bartlett was head of ACT Forests during the catastrophic 2003 Canberra fires, which took out most of the Territory's commercial pine plantations. He worries that that was merely a warm-up. The fire that caused so much trouble and destruction here in Canberra in 2003, um, the fires in 2050 are probably going to be even worse than that. So we need to design for the future um, and give the suburbs on the western side of our western and northern sides of our city the best chance of um, surviving uh, the onslaught of severe bushfires. 
but he says our love of the bush could threaten new suburbs. So we hear a lot about pines and their flammability, their proximity to suburbs. How does it compare? Oh, I think red stringy bark forest is much more of a problem than pine forest. And with increasing pressure on the ACT's suburban land reserves, the government's allowing more and more development along the western fringe of Canberra, the same area badly burnt back in 2003. I don't have any problem with people living in these new suburbs, um, but I think the key thing is that they do need to understand that they are buying into areas where there is a bushfire risk. Traditionally our worst fire weather comes from the west and northwest in Canberra. Would you live in those suburbs on the urban interface there? I would be comfortable living in those suburbs as a well-informed resident, understanding design and innovation around how you can build a resilient home, having your own fire protection zones around your home, preparing your home every season, understanding how to evacuate and where to evacuate to, and most importantly, understanding the meaning of alerts and warnings. And if a fire does break out, the ESA Commissioner says her organisation's willingness to warn the public sooner has massively shifted since the fires of 20 years ago. Do you think in 2003 the lack of public information was the critical failing that still haunts Canberrans today? When Canberrans talked to me, and certainly the feedback we received during 1920, was that they did want situational awareness. They were craving for information. Having read those recounts, both from staff and the community, that certainly influenced and shaped the approach that I took in 2019, 2020. And that was to, as I said publicly, uh, alert you, not alarm you and I would rather apologise for too much information than for something critical to be missed. A lack of public warning nearly cost Liz Tilly her life back in 2003, when her Duffy home burnt to the ground. She rebuilt on the edge of the bush and loves it too, but recognises that there's a risk in her lifestyle that none of us can take lightly. I think the major thing that I would say to people that are living in these urban interface areas is just to be aware and to have a plan, to think about and discuss with your family what you would do in the event of any sort of natural disaster. I think what we would do is, is just get out as soon as we could. Um, I don't, we didn't really have that choice when the fires came in 2003, but this time I think we'd just leave and just take our valuables and the house is insured if it goes, it goes. If the recent black summer taught Australians anything, it was that under the worst conditions, fires are simply unstoppable. Which means during fire emergencies, residents will have to take more responsibility for their own safety. Come the time of reckoning, we may not be able to put a fire truck at the corner of every street. We may not have an ambulance for every suburb. And so it really is about how we can work together in partnership to prepare ourselves to respond on our worst day. Will we lose homes in Canberra again, do you think? We could potentially lose homes, I never say never.